This is the end of the dollar. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, the dollar's dominance as the global reserve currency is in jeopardy as China's latest deal with Brazil looks to dethrone King Dollar. And we're going to take a look at what China's up to, what their broad plan is here, and if it will be successful of removing the dollar as a reserve currency. And one analyst says there's no chance that that's going to happen. It doesn't matter what China does. The dollar is going to be remain king in global trade. We're going to take a look at why he says that and if he's right. And plus, is there a situation where the entire world could turn against the dollar? Well, there is, and it's playing out right now. We're going to take a look at what that is and why those in charge of the dollar can't see it happening. Let's head over. We pick today's story up with a headline. Drubbing the dollar, China and Brazil ditch the dollar, strike deal to settle trade in yuan and the real. And this is a big deal because the reason the dollar is king is because of global trade. Everyone transacts in it. Everybody wants it. And if you could remove its power in global trade and replace it with another currency, you start to sow the seeds of the beginning of the next reserve currency, which many believe will be the yuan. And both countries are now reached a deal where it's settled bilateral trade in their own currencies as the trade deal is expected to reduce the transaction cost between China and Brazil and also seen as China's latest salvo against the U.S. dollar that has been so far enjoying the status of the world's main reserve currency. And for Americans, this is a really big deal because if you look at our prosperity and our success, it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the dollar is a reserve currency. And so there's a lot of fear here that if someone could come along, particularly a country with like China, and revoke that status and place their currency with it, that our success, that our way of life is going to go away, but maybe not just yet. The Brazilian Trade and Investment Promotion Agency in a statement said settling cross-border trade in yuan real is expected to reduce costs and promote even greater bilateral trade and facilitate investment. And so we see this from the onset that this is just to reduce transaction costs because what you see, at least in global trade here, is that these two countries, in order to trade with, the other, with each other, have to convert to dollars, make the trade, and then convert back to their local currencies. To put this and give you an analogy of how this might work is let's say you have someone who has bread and someone who has apples, but yet they can't directly trade with each other because the world says that our global currency is chickens. So they have to convert both their bread and apples into chickens, trade chickens, and then convert those back to the goods that they want. And so that causes additional transaction costs. It creates additional time and it doesn't actually work. So what we're seeing, at least from the story here out of Brazil is, hey, we're doing this just to make things easier for us. And that actually does make a lot of sense. As these transactions will be executed by the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China and the Bank of Communications, BBM, it's worth mentioning that China has similar currency deals with Russia, Pakistan, and several other nations. And this is the fear here, is that they're going around the world and making more and more of these deals to the point where perhaps people will stop wanting to trade in the dollar and start wanting to trade in the yuan. As China overtook the U.S. in 2009 to become Brazil's largest trading partner, Beijing accounts for more than a fifth of all imports. China is Brazil's largest export nation market, according for more than a third of all exports. So again, you see that this does actually make some sense in terms of facilitating trade. But the notion that this means the dollar goes away, well, maybe not so quick, because if you think about our situation from before, where we have bread and apples, if indeed trade is increased out of this, well, perhaps the bread maker needs flour, and they don't have access to that in China, so they have to go onto the global market where they need dollars to get flour and perhaps the orchard well they need fertilizer but neither country has it so they too have to go onto the global market and trade in dollars and get more fertilizer so in a sense that what you see here is by facilitating trade that's led to believe it will increase the amount of trade and consumption it actually is good for the dollar 
And here's why experts say Russia and China's attempts to de-dollarize global markets are going nowhere because this analyst says this doesn't matter at all. The question is, what do you think? Do you think this is part of China's master plan to dethrow the dollar and become the global reserve currency? I want you to weigh in the comments. I want to know what you think. Or do you think that perhaps like this analyst is about to say, none of this actually matters? After being targeted by Western sanctions over the invasion of Ukraine, Russia has vowed to de-dollarize the economy. Of course, we knew that went nowhere with measures including shunning currencies from unfriendly countries and planning to create a new reserve currency with China to challenge the dollar's position as the leading global currency of trade. And that is what everyone fears about, that somehow China and Russia are going to create this currency. Everybody suddenly is going to want it. And of course, we know there's part of the story here because who's been amassing lots of gold? Well, we know China and Russia are, and that perhaps this new gold-backed reserve currency will be very attractive to people over the dollar. Of course, we're gonna make the case that why that could possibly happen, what is going on in the global economy right now that could get people to turn against the dollar. But first, let's see what this analyst has to say. Zagorsky is skeptical that Russia's plans for a reserve currency with China and other nations would see much demand. Past attempts to create a common reserve currency, such as recent plans between Brazil and Argentina, have typically failed, he said, especially when partner nations are on uneven economic footing. So well, that's interesting because you would think that China and Brazil are completely on uh, uneven footing here. So the question is, how long will this go on? Because one country, namely Brazil, is likely to be a beneficiary of a whole bunch of yuan that they might not need and need to go out to the global market and convert or go to the debt markets in China and convert it to bonds. So we'll see how that plays out because that is a factor here. And he goes on to say it's less of Russia trying to challenge dollar dominance more than China is a super economic power in the world. It's part from a larger China strategy, Stark said. He's pointed to warnings from Dr. Doom economist Noriel Rubini, who we've had on the show and featured his work, who said a bipolar currency system could emerge over the next decade, wherein the yuan will rival the dollar in global trade. And this is, again, what everyone afraid of, but the reality is the pos probability of this happening is actually a lot lower than most people think. But while Stark thinks this yuan dollar regime is possible, he said the scenario is only a distant possibility because it takes a long time for currency to be trusted and widely used in trade. It'll take a long time to topple the greenback, which is counted for get this 96% of world trade in the recent decades, according to the Federal Reserve. Meanwhile, the yuan accounted for just 2% of global trade in the first half of 2022. So you think about how many American companies, because remember, we're the world's largest just import nation. How many American companies are going to go out in the global markets and say, hey, you know what? We're trading in yuan now. I'd like to have that. I can imagine, and you can give me your guess, I think it's somewhere close to zero, the number of com companies that would choose to trade in yuan versus trading in dollars. But that's not the only part of the story. Maybe it's that China doesn't have what it takes to be a global reserve currency. So Gorsky rebuffed the notion that the dollar would be displaced by the yuan at all due to China's capital controls on its currency, such as limiting the amount of yuan that can be taken out of the country. As long as those rules are in pay place, that makes the yuan less liquid than currencies like the U.S. dollar and therefore less attractive. And that's really important because, you know, we talk about the global dollar shortage. I talk about it with my friend Jeff Snyder on his channel, Eurodollar University. And one of the key things of being a global reserve currency is you have to let your currency get out in the world and have a whole bunch of it. So if you have capital controls in place to begin with, and let's say that China removed those for sake of example, and say, you know what, we're going to make an attempt to be a global reserve currency. If you want to take your money out of our country, go ahead. And I'm going to be willing to bet that there'd be a ton of money flowing out of that country faster than you've ever seen. And that's one of those reasons they've got these capital controls in place, because they know it. And that alone, not to mention the problems in their banking system keeps them from being anywhere near a reserve currency. 
And one thing we pointed out in recent shows to our pro subscribers of CTA Timber Pro, and we know that I want you to see that crude oil is continuing to add buying signals. We'll cover this more on Sunday's show. Many of you have asked about this. Again, it's $30 a month. Link in the description below. One of the easiest reports you can use to trade. And now let's talk about what could dethrone the dollar. What could get everybody to turn their back against it? Well, it's a lot it has to do with the financial system here in the U.S. and those in charge of it. The Fed gauge of financial stress is approaching levels of concern, this from Zero Hedge, as it's not just the credit markets that are sending out a signal of distress. A key barometer that the Fed watches, the St. Louis Fed Financial Stress Index, is telegraphing a similar message about the U.S. economy. And of course, we know here that where the U.S. economy goes, the world follows. And if the U.S. economy has another financial crisis or another massive recession, it's going to bring the entire world down with it. And if we can't manage our own banking system, which right now it appears that we're having trouble with, perhaps the entire world will start to look for alternatives sooner than we think. And while the spread between high yield and investment grade debt captures one major variable, the Fed's gauge comprises a host of yield spreads, interest rates, and other indicators. And here we can see that this thing is moving higher. And we can look back, you know, all the way back to the 1994, and we can see that financial stress stayed below the black line, but only during times of where we're having a potential recession, or we did have a recession, where prolonged increases in financial stress led to, of course, financial Financial crises, the dot-com bubble, and a whole host of other things, almost a double a recession in 2015, 2016, and now it's rising. And I want you to see, first of all, you know what the warning signs of this are, and then we're going to head over to the president of the St. Louis Fed, and I want you to see that they wrote about this, and they have no clue what it actually means because they think they've got it under control, and they don't. From a position of the equity markets, we can see when financial stress starts to build and, and stay elevated, you know, the red line we have now, the Wilshire 5000 price index, it leads to a decline in equity prices. We see that happening each and every time financial stress starts to build. It's starting to build now, but what we're hearing from policymakers is, hey, we've got this under control. But the yield curve, something we refer to on the show frequently, said, look, we saw this coming and all you had to do is follow of this here we have the 10-year two-year yield curve or the two tens curve it's referred to as where we take 10-year yields less two-year yields and we can note that when it's in inversion below the black line it actually starts to signal financial stress building in the system and as it steepens as we've talked about in a bull steepener phase it leads to an increasing amount of financial stress and you can see it here going in the dot-com bubble the global financial crisis you can see it starting to build just before the pandemic and look what's happening now. And what are we hearing again from the Fed that we've got this under control? And I want you to see just how much they miss their own signals here. Now we've got the Fed effective federal fund rate shown in red. And note, as financial stress is building, you know, the one thing you would think they would do is at least maybe pause or say, hey, you know what? We're not sure what's going on. Let's cut rates a little bit. Well, that doesn't happen at all. In fact, the Fed is notably known for actually raising rates as financial stress indicates or increases until something starts to break, then they start to pause, and next thing you know, the Fed chases rates down as the whole system falls apart. We can see that happen almost every time as financial stress rises, the Fed has got the blinders on, and here we see it once again, and now let's head over to the St. Louis Fed. Again, the central bank or the regional central bank that creates this index here from the president of it, James Bullard, re writing recently, what do financial conditions indexes tell us that you think something important here? And he says that monitoring these financial conditions is important for assessing the impact of monetary policy on financial markets and for keeping an eye out for potential financial instability. So let's just stop here because their own data is telling them, what do we have here? We have potential financial instability and perhaps it's because of monetary policy, which notably he's going to admit here momentarily is having an impact. 
And while the, the index remained at a low value through early March, financial stress has been on the rise, he says, since the wake of recent bank failures. If there's any indication of financial stress and problems in the system, that would be it. And the macro prudential policy response to these events has been swift and appropriate, and regulatory authorities have used the tools we've created during the global financial crisis to limit the damage. In my view, he goes on to say, continued appropriate macro prudential policy can contain financial stress in the current environment while appropriate monetary policy can continue to put downward pressure on inflation and the only question remains is is he completely clueless here because perhaps it's their monetary policy is raising rates that are actually leading to an increase in financial stress but he notes that hey this is worth it if inflation comes down well bullard you're going to get that for sure here we can see if inflation can, perhaps it is inflation that actually leads to an increase in financial stress. We could make that case because there are periods where inflation is rising. They now show in the CPI where financial stress in increases, but notably when financial stress goes too high and starts to break the system, no, what do we see? Inflation comes down each and every time. So perhaps, Bullard, you can sacrifice the financial system to bring inflation down, but I don't think that's the right move, and nor do I think that China is gonna be taking over as a world's reserve currency anytime soon. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.